What is up, Theology Nerds? This is Trip, and well, you're listening to the Theology Nerd Podcast, which surprisingly is a podcast created for theology nerds like yourself. That's right. And today on the podcast, you're going to get to hear from my friend and soon to be your your ear buddy, uh, Andrew Schwartz. Andrew is a recent uh, PhD graduate at Claremont Graduate University. He is also the director, uh, executive director for the Center for Process Studies. That is a center that does um, it connects process philosophy to like every discipline, from like agriculture to economics to philosophy. Works with different religious traditions and all that kind of stuff. Um, so he's going to tell you more about it. Uh, also, he, is, he you'll hear more of his story, but he grew up Nazarene in the middle of the country, comes out here, and he just finished working on um, a, a, a dissertation in religious pluralism and, and, and what it means to have deep religious pluralism. So we're going to end up talking about that, his story, some process fun uh, and things. But uh, before we jump in, I just want to let you know a few things, uh, a few things, because one of them is that if you're interested in open and relational theology, which process theology counts, or like uh, Moltmann and social Trinitarians or open theology and such, we are putting together a video course in an online community for open and relational youth ministers. So if you work with students of any kind and want to be a part of this this uh like one, a video course, but also an online group to share resources, encouragement of how you lead students as a open and relationally centered theologian uh, and minister, then join the group. You can text open youth to four, four, two, 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 open youth, no spaces, four, four, two, 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 or go to the website. There'll be links and stuff. Uh, also, I want to let you know, uh, in just two weeks, we have our first Epic Reads, um, and, you know, since I finished my dissertation, we're, we're starting up Epic Reads again. This is where the members of the homebrewed community, we read stuff. This time we're reading an article by Bernard Loomer. We're going to talk about it. He is a uh, 20th century uh, philosophical theologian. The book is on, uh, the article's on types of understandings of power and such. It's going to be fun. Uh, if you want to join the community, homebrewed community, go to homebrewedcommunity.com homebrewcommunity.com you can become a member be a part of the secret facebook group get tons and tons of, of classes and downloads and things that you would normally just have to go pay for in the download store but members can just get them right out of a special little collection right there in the member group um you also are, are one of the few that that keep the podcast going that make it uh, possible so yeah, i would love any of you to love the podcast would like to support it uh, to, to interact more, to have input on what goes on, uh, to join like the Epic Reads and classes and our Google Hangouts and all that kind of stuff, go to homebrewcommunity.com and join up. Uh, this summer, this summer, let me know if you're going to the Wild Goose Festival in July 13th to 16th in Hot Springs, North Carolina, because I'm going to be there. And this year, I mean, we've done podcasts at Wild Goose for, I don't know, five or six years or so Wild Goose. I love going there. Uh, for years, I did the music for the little kids, like, you know, songs of the hand motions about how God loves everyone and wants you to care for others. I did that because I like cheesy songs with kids with hand motions. Well, uh, this year, it's the first year, the podcast is going to be on the main stage. So if you've been thinking about going to Wild Goose, you should go because you want to see what happens when the podcast is on the main stage at the Wild Goose Festival. On top of that, there's going to be tons of great music, a lot of other speakers, and um, I know the Culture Cast is going to be there, and our friends from a whole bunch of other podcasts are going to be there at the Podcast Tent. Uh, you don't want to miss it. If you if you live around the North Carolina area, or you want to go for a little drive in, camp out in one of the most amazing, beautiful places. I'm from North Carolina, so I'm a little biased, but the mountains of North Carolina are amazing. Well, uh, then come to Wild Goose Festival this summer, and if you're coming, then you need to let me know, because we we're organizing an area where all the homebrewed podcast listeners can camp next to each other, if you can. We're going to camp next to each other so we can hang out at night, talk, and get to know each other and have some fun. So, yeah, holler at us if you're coming. Last thing is beer camp. Theology beer camp this August. It's starting in Denver, then we're going to Oklahoma City. Um, but Theology beer camp is this summer. That is right, me and Peter Rollins doing Theology beer camp. You're going to get to taste amazing craft beer that is local in that area you're going to have fun you're going to have nerdiness you're going to have games and the coolest part is you're going to meet local theology nerds like people that are a couple hours from the city are all going to be converging 
I know I have heard that people people are flying in to Denver and Oklahoma City. That they're like, look, I live on the East Coast, I live on the West Coast. I couldn't go this winter when you did it in L.A. And I want to go. I don't want to have to wait. I want the theology beer camp experience. Well, good. Everyone's welcome. And once you once you get um, once you sign up, there's a a group of people in both cities. We could call them our camp counselors that are helping everybody find a place to stay, give them input on um, you know those kinds of things, like the logistics. So you don't have to trust me about what's happening in Oklahoma City or in Denver. There are people there that are excited that homebrewed Christianity deacons are going to be converging on their city this summer. So go to theologybeercamp.com, find out details, come on out. It's going to be a blast. Like, seriously, it is. I'm just excited. Oh, yeah. Now, that's it. I'd like to introduce you to Andrew Schwartz. Doctor. The good Dr. Andrew Schwartz. The director. That's right. That sounds that's very, very impressive. I'm the director of the Center for Process Studies. I hope you enjoy this conversation. Because, you know, I did. Peace. Hello, Homebrewed Christianity listeners. This is Trip, and today you're going to get to hear from the director of the Center for Process Studies, Dr. Andrew Schwartz. What's up, Andrew? Hey, what's up, Trip? How's it going? Well, well, I mean, it's going good because now, now we're both we're both uh, real doctors. Yes. Yeah. But but when you say real doctor, you don't mean the kind that are going to help people if you have a heart attack or if you sprain an ankle. No. Uh, you know. Right. Just, just a few. If you have uh, backed up arteries of the soul, then mm. yes, then, uh, we, <laughs> get, get, we can help you out. Uh, you know, we don't want things getting lodged. And it, you've once, got an injured metaphysic. Yeah, yeah. Look, if you've been making metaphysical compliments to God that are unnecessary, then have we got a solution for you? No more <laughs> omnipotence. Um, so, yeah, Andrew is is uh, a, a, is a, is a friend. And we were students together, and uh, now we're going to talk, which I can guarantee you this will not be like other podcasts because um, I, I I like talking to him too much not to tell him what I think. You know, sometimes you just have to be respectful to your elders, you know? Mm. You don't like okay. stop them and be like, look, I read your book. I didn't like half of it, all right? I'm just going to tell you. So, uh, but before we, before we talk... I, you need to let us know what's happening this summer at the Center for Process Studies, the Summer Institute. Yeah. So uh, June 5th through 8th this summer, um, both online or in person. We've got both options, which is great. Um, we've got the annual Process Theology Summer Institute. Uh, so it's uh, basically three segments that are all um, – you can need to, you can take – one, you can take two, you can take all three, um, you know, pick your poison, so to speak. Uh, and there's, they're divided up. So Monica Coleman is teaching one, uh, exploring process thought, spiritual terrorism, spiritual liberation. Uh, so that actually uh, will be fascinating. Yeah, and she talked a little bit about it a few weeks ago on the podcast, too. Exactly. Before so we got distracted and started talking about parenting. <laughs> Which is the terrorism part, probably? Yeah, yeah. That's um, that. Well, that was more my children. I didn't want to. I didn't want to call. Her. Anyway, yeah. Don't you put that evil on me, Ricky Bobby? Uh, so then, uh, the section section I'll be doing is uh, topics and process thought, deep religious pluralism. So I'll be exploring uh, what does religious commitment look like in a pluralistic age, and how are we to reconcile uh, conflict, conflicting religious truth claims. Um, and then doing that uh, by looking at the process perspective uh, in the midst, midst of all that. Um, what David Griffin talks about is a deep religious pluralism. Uh, calls people like John Hicks shallow. Oh. Um, yeah. Or identist. Um, and then we've got, uh, for the first time, I think, uh, for the Center for Process Studies, uh, a professor from Vanderbilt, uh, Herbert Robinson Marbury, who's going to be doing process theology and biblical interpretation. Uh, so he's a professor of Hebrew Bible uh, at Vanderbilt Divinity School. So yeah, uh, take a look at processandfaith.org. Uh, you can either take it for credit through the School of Theology uh, in, in Claremont, which just talk to the registrar, 
or you can do it for personal enrichment Ooh, yeah. directly through the Center for Process Studies and Process and Faith. And you can, and if you if you do it for credit and you're at another seminary, you can, uh, you know, transfer the credit there because exactly. I did that when I was in seminary and yeah. or divinity school, not seminary because you know there's uh, a big difference. Is there? Tell me about that difference. No, it just means one's connected to a <laughs> university. It's, and I, and even then, I'm not sure it always works. It's. But uh, but div school sounds cooler if you're going to shorthand it, you know. If like you're like, yeah. oh, when I went to div school, like so if you're like, today, I went to sim school. I've been and so I did my my bachelor's degree in religion and pastoral ministry at uh, Northwest Nazarene University, mm-hmm. and that's when I got introduced to process theology from uh, the illustrious Thomas J. Ord. The illustrious, uh, yeah, and then. Uh, Went to the Nazarene Seminary and did a master's in theology. Came to Claremont, did, and in the whole time of working in ministry and religion and theology, it wasn't until today that I heard somebody say that they just graduated from the demon program, and I realized that they graduated from the demon program. The demon program. The demon program, Ooh. as in like angels and demon program. Mm, I don't know. I, 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 I don't know. I, maybe that's just me, but I, for some reason, I never put those two together. The doctorate of ministry sounds an awful lot like, uh, you know, something demon. from Supernatural. I got a demon. Yeah. I got my demon. Well, yeah. I've yeah. read some things on the internet uh, where uh, some more evangelical theologians associate process theology with demons. So, you know, um, th- yeah. that might happen. <laughs> Yeah, it's interesting. Uh, I don't know many process theologians that actually do a lot of talking about demons. David Ray Griffin has these three essays on the demonic that are excellent. And yeah. they are like an introduction to postmodern constructive theology, Where, but he uses like demons and the demonic uh, to go through the whole thing. And that's the only thing I can think of. Yeah. But, you know, what? It, so what does a director of a center at an academic institution do? Yeah. So uh, by day, I do pretty much everything that John Cobb tells me to. Well, uh, so you by listen night, to JC. I do uh, everything that John Cobb thinks, but doesn't actually ask me to do. Oh. Uh, so mostly it's, no, uh, no, but so, I mean, we're a faculty research center. So, um, you know, we're beholden to the direction and the leadership of our faculty at Claremont School of Theology. So Monica Coleman, Philip Clayton, Roland Faber, uh, and then also our three emeritus faculty, uh, David Ray Griffin, Marjorie Suhaki, and John B. Cobb Jr. Uh, and we, uh, so we do, you know, obviously conferences and seminars and courses, and we've got our library, uh, visiting scholars program, you know, all sorts of cool stuff. And I just try to make sure that that ship stays afloat. Well, it's, be- it's better than sinking. It is. Yeah. So I know I think things are going well. I've been doing, uh, I came in actually as the communications director as a student worker with federal work study. So thank you, U.S. government, for making it possible for me to be where I am today. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, uh, no. So then um, eventually, so I became the managing director of, uh, about three and a half years ago, and then uh, actually became the executive director uh, just this past September. Mm -hmm. The main difference is uh, now I have more responsibility for like long-term goals and fundraising and other sorts of directions that uh, I did not have responsibility for before. So you said that you, you know, went through Nazarene um, undergrad and and, uh, divinity school. Correct. Uh, and you wrote a dissertation on on deep pluralism. Yeah, I'm guessing that if we talk to freshman, 18 year old Andrew, uh, his first day when he stepped on a Nazarene campus, uh-huh. if if I was like, guess what you're going to do? You're going to write a dissertation on process theology's understanding of deep religious pluralism. Um, that's not what. That's not. You wouldn't have known what to do with that. I would have said, um, what is process theology? Uh, what do you mean by pluralism? Uh, what makes it deep? Uh, yeah, I would have had no idea what I was talking to when I was, uh, so, I mean, actually I grew up in a religiously diverse household. Mm-hmm. Uh, so my dad's Jewish. Uh, my mom had a Christian background. 
Neither of them were actually religiously active, um, but they decided that they wanted me to be a good moral person. They should probably send me to a church or something like that. My dad figured, yeah, Christianity, it's like Judaism with a little extra, so why not? And um, and uh, so I started going to Awanas at the local, uh, the non-denominational church. Um, and then I guess like, I, you know, I guess I, I was proselytizing to one of my little friends, like, you know, I was like five years old and he can, he started coming to Awanas and then he, he told his mom that she should go to church now. And she, his mom told my mom that she should go to church before you know it, everybody's in church. And my mom says, you know, I was thinking my great, my grandmother, you know, her grandmother, my great grandmother once told me those Nazarenes, they're good Bible believing people. Apparently that stuck with her and decided we should start going to a Nazarene church. Oh. Yeah. Right. Uh, so, uh, so we did. And, um, and I decided when I was in high school that um, if I really cared about God, uh, if I thought, you know, oh, if you're going to devote yourself to something, you know, the most important thing in the world, God, uh, might as well include your occupation as well. I mean, that made sense to me. You know, it's all or nothing. Um, you know, I'm not just giving half of myself. Yeah. So, so I decided to go and study ministry uh, and then... While I was at Northwest Nazarene University, I was opened up to the variety of ways in which you can serve God and minister in the church. Um, but I also became increasingly interested in diversity in different ways of understanding and world, uh, both within Christianity and beyond. Mm-hmm. And I was intrigued by questions of salvation and exclusivism, you know, oh, hey, how come that annoying kid, you know, doing graffiti on the back of the pew is mm. going to heaven, but uh, Gandhi's going to hell? That didn't seem right. Um, yeah, it doesn't. <laughs> and I'm not sure that that was the case anyways, but uh, it, it made me think. Uh, so I started asking some questions like that. Uh, stumbled across this guy named John Hick when I was in the Nazarene Seminary, um, only to find out that at Claremont, everybody knew who he was because... Uh, you know, he taught here. Taught here, um, and uh, yeah. So I became more and more interested in thinking of, I guess, taking seriously uh, what pe- you know the fact that people believe passionately different things about these ultimate questions and mysteries of life, mm-hmm. uh, and what that means for what I believe and how I live in the world. Mm-hmm. So we, when. How do you understand the the nature of religious commitment then for the individual? Like have, in in kind of looking back through your own autobiography, and then it becomes a biography where you know obviously the way your own parents and you saw religious commitment changed over time, and mm-hmm. that being a place that you begin to reflect on and thinking through your dissertation, like how would you describe religious uh, commitment? That's a good question. Um, you know, my, my impulse is to want to say that religious commitment uh, is in process. Ooh, no, uh, yeah, right. Um, but I mean, but in all truth, that, that uh, I'm not the same. There's, there's a sense in which I'm both different and the same today as I was when I was 18 year old me. Um, and um, I think that's OK. Mm-hmm. In fact, it's actually probably a good thing. And what I think we often, so I know, I mean, I've, I've had this myself and I know a lot of friends of mine who, when you start studying theology, um, in the beliefs that you held onto from when you were a little child, which, you know, aren't as, uh, as well developed or, uh, you know, as they hopefully would become by the time you finish a doctorate in the subject, um, those those uh, core beliefs that you hold on to passionately start to get challenged. Uh, and a lot of times people have like a crisis of faith. You know, I don't know what to believe. I don't know who I am. Um, I think the crisis has more to do with the, the assumption that uh, believing something different or being on a journey or asking questions or continually trying to, to create ourselves and find ourselves and rediscover ourselves. that that's a bad thing. Mm-hmm. Um, 
And actually, I would say that that probably stems from um, a, a bad metaphysic. Uh, you know, sort of goes back to like that perfect being metaphysic, mm-hmm. right? If if something is perfect, you know, then it changes, and it's changing away from perfection. Um, so I think people assume that if you have a belief and it's true, and then you change that belief, that it's changing from truth to falsity, something like that. Yeah. Um, so you so you you get anxious about. Uh, the transformation of growing into a mature uh, person of faith. Um, and that's not something we should shy away from. It's something I think we should embrace. Yeah. I mean, I, I know that at some point in, in my life, I no longer, I like stop being embarrassed about the previous versions of myself. Hmm. And that that was actually the key for me to become more generous towards people. Uh, I have, significant differences with right like Mm. when i realized that um the like very annoying middle school calvinist version of trip was still part of trip's story and that um i sometimes joke about it like when you switch your mind you, you don't have to create a whole new blog and then spend the next year complaining about what you were six months ago Right, like yeah. where as oh now I finally arrived, so now let me burn the ships that got me here, right? So th- that like getting the point to realize that part of fidelity is owning your past and how ha- and that it is going to be a part of your present regardless. So denying it, hating it, and all that kind of stuff uh, it doesn't really free you to open yourself up to more possibilities. And um, if you can love versions of yourself that you chose not to keep around, then it's a lot easier to be compassionate and graceful towards uh, others you have, you have difference with. Yeah. It's a little thing I like to call um, prehension. (laughs) So, uh, you know, yeah, we, we take in our past. It's, it's part of who we are, but we're not determined by it. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, so there's always freedom and creativity to become, uh, a better version of ourselves, or at least we always want to strive to be. Um, so in the, in, in the striving, like what, uh, w- what makes a commitment religious or maybe how do you understand the shape of an active and engaged faith? You know, I think that's got to, it takes different shapes for different people in different contexts. Um, I don't know if there's, you know, I, I, I'd be hesitant to say there's, one way of being religious or one way of, good. you know, uh, having faith in action. Um, but, um, gosh, this sounds real corny, but I feel like follow your heart seems kind of like something you should do. Um, I feel like, so there is a, a philosopher, actually somebody who's written a lot on process thought, Nicholas Rescher, mm-hmm. um, who has this fascinating epistemology um, where of, of perspectivalism. And at one point in time, I think he says something along the lines, you know, sorry, Nick, if I'm misquoting you here, but um, something along the lines of uh, we should accept, you know, embrace our own perspective because if you're not going to, you know, embrace your, I mean, if it's not going to be your views, whose views are you going to hold, mm-hmm. right? Um, we're kind of limited to our own context. Um, uh, so I don't know. I mean, you do the best you can with where you are and what you've got and acknowledge that you take your perspective with you, but it doesn't always have to be the same perspective. Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, I think that's important because, uh, some shape, uh, uh, depictions of what like the, the highest religious commitment or faith looks like. Um, there are assumptions that it, it is a singular thing. And that ends up making like faith a religious commitment and practice and piety uh, into a burden or uh, and for some like a straight up terror because like this is what God wants from you. This is what's being demanded of you. You better get there and that kind of thing. And uh, kind of rather than the, the move to seeing it as a, a practice that you're engaged in uh, daily connected to your living, um, I think opens up a way of – reintroducing uh like like the notion of religious practice and commitment in kind of not so uh a uh, weighty in the worst way uh you know where where the where the uh, yoke is not that uh burdensome the 
you know, what what would you like when for you was the moment in your in your own kind of like education and life that you saw process thought being a a conversation worth lingering in hmm. that's an interesting question i would say probably like my senior year of college mm-hmm. uh taking systematic theology from tom ward where it wasn't actually I don't think it should probably was properly a systematic theology class as much as it was like a philosophy of religion class with the intro to process and some other things, um, which was fantastic. Uh, so I actually realized at that moment that there was something called philosophy of religion and that I really liked it. Um, but when Tom started explaining, you know, helping us ask some of these questions about uh, the theodicy and the problem of evil, um, I started to realize that the the uh, the views of God that I had before the classical theistic perspectives did not have a good answer for why you know uh, an all loving God uh, would allow such innocent and evil things to ha- you know innocent evil things to happen to so many innocent people um, didn't make sense but with a process understanding I started to think well wait a second there might be something there another way to understand how the world works and how God works in the world Mm -hmm. without getting rid of God and without just, you know, accepting that, you know, rape's a way to, I guess, help you grow spiritually. Um, You know, so yeah, theodicy, it was my first thought. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and so when was uh, the question around religious pluralism, like on your, on your radar as a, because no one, no one writes a dissertation. On yeah. something they're like, you know what? That's neat. <laughs> so in the same time as an undergraduate, I I really was focusing more on like diversity within Christianity. Because mm-hmm. uh, growing up in Nazarene, I was like, well, it wasn't, I, I was actually somewhat a little bit shameful of just how little I realized there was diversity regarding biblical interpretations, view of divine agency. I mean, all sorts of things, right? Um and the more I started to appreciate different atonement theories and different ways of understanding the role that Jesus plays in, uh, in atonement, like uh, it started opening me up to, well, what about people outside of Christianity? Yeah. Um, so I did a semester abroad in the Middle East uh, with the Coalition of Christian Colleges and Universities. Uh, I think it's the CCCU. Uh, studying Judaism, Islam, Christianity um, in that region. And then... Um, you know, years later, uh, went to India um, as a doctoral researcher studying, you know, Jainism, Hinduism, Buddhism, uh, and became more and more and just fascinated by that there are radically different ways of, of seeing the world or different answers to very common questions, uh, even different questions, right? Um, so the, yeah, I don't know, there, it's not... Uh, it's not hard to realize that the world's full of lots of difference. Uh, not everybody agrees. Well, um, it, it, I think it's it, recognizing it for is one thing. Seeing seeing the difference and all the different ways people and in really traditions have understand uh, what it means to be human, to have community, yeah. what love looks like, uh, what a good life looks like, uh, what wisdom looks like, like. The, the, there's a shift I think that happens in people where you you start to you want to learn to appreciate what exists in um, traditions that are significantly different. Like in yeah. like you said, yeah, and they might even ask completely different questions. I think that's an important observation because I know a lot of conservative Christians that like have at will ask me something you know like start to share the story and the questions that come up that you were describing or maybe they had that kind of study experience and it's like not until they can set aside the the framing question of their relationship to the non-christian other as Mm -hmm. something about jesus right like Mm -hmm. they you if that's how you set the table then um there's already a power relationship established where you're not really you're not able to listen and and learn and really benefit in the way you could 
Uh, yeah. if, if you hung around long enough to know why it's beautiful, they ask the framing questions they do. Yeah. Yeah. I think there's, so for me, I can see it sort of a, like a spectrum of, of approaches. So like first is just to acknowledge that, yeah, there's a plurality there. Not everybody's the same. Not everybody agrees. I guess, um, just the descriptive acknowledgement of diversity. And that doesn't take much. I mean, pretty much everybody can do that. Um, but then moving a step further where you're saying, oh, well, I can actually embrace that difference and see something beautiful in it. Maybe even start to say, well, I can learn something about what it means to be a Christian by uh, talking with Buddhists, um, which actually was sort of a, a revolutionary idea for me and, and for, for others that I've uh, journeyed with. Um, well, you know, what can Buddhism teach Christianity? They're, you know, it's not even the same. Uh, but even more foundationally for me, uh, was starting to ask like the deeper questions of like uh, truth and contradictions and philosophical underpinnings of a pluralistic framework that tries to reconcile contradictions. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, so like a lot of a lot of uh, what we call pluralists, you know, these people who are trying to reconcile these differences uh, without saying that you know one is true and everything else is false. Um, generally, try to say, well, it's more than one can be true because they're complementary, right? So it's like the orange is this color and the apple is this color. And that doesn't mean that, you know, it's what the apple color is wrong. And the, you know, I mean, it's just, it's different, um, mm. but it's not contradictory. Uh, so actually the work that I, I had been doing the last couple of years is focusing on the need to explore complementary approaches as opposed to just sort of tackling contradiction head on, mm-hmm. which gets traced back to sort of like, laws of non-contradiction and classical logic and all the stuff with Aristotle. And I, uh, I found it fascinating to look into like sort of pair consistent logics, um, like alternative logical theories and frameworks, uh, dialethism and like the kind of stuff that also happens a lot in Eastern philosophy within Jainism, uh, forms of Hinduism and Buddhism, where, uh, it sort of embraces more of a paradoxical approach, mm-hmm. uh, that some things might actually be both true and false at the same time. Uh, and that actually the, they're false in so far as they're true and true in so far as they're false. And it makes everybody's head hurt, which is, I think why I was actually able to graduate because my committee didn't understand what I was talking about. Um, well, don't tell them now. <laughs> it's too late. They yeah. already gave me my degree. All right. Um, but I think, yeah, but I, I've, uh, I'm really interested in, uh, trying to see the world in, in different ways and challenging sort of the fundamental assumptions that I have, not because I think that they're wrong, but because I think they need to be explored. Mm-hmm. Well, and, and I think that the, like one of the things that is clear is it's not just, you know, conflicting particular religious claims that kind of ask for a framework for thinking about religious diversity. But, um, I, you know, if we don't respect and cooperate uh, you know, the planet's not going to do wonderful. And the growing hosp- hostility between uh, religions is probably not ideal either. So yeah. the, the, I think there's a, I, I just imagine people at one, oh, it's true in the same sense it's not true. They're like, what in the world? That happens right. in California. But underneath yeah. it, yeah. I think there's a sense that goes, um, we know what happens when people hold the truth with with absolute certainty in their hands and encounter someone with difference. We, the human yeah. history is littered with dead people from that solution. Yeah. So how, as someone who's committed in a particular religious tradition, can I try to understand this in ways we might cooperate to not kill the planet and shoot each other in the meantime? Right? Yeah. Like, like, I just want to say, like, I mean, I know yeah. you said it in the most nerdy way, but... Exactly. But... There's just like a basic need. Well, we've got a lot of history on if they conflict, let's all conflict. Uh, so, and I think part of it is really begins with understanding the nature of religion. And um, I remember when uh, when I read ooh one of David Ray Griffin's books about pluralism, um, the. Two Ultimates in Religions or the Deep Pluralism book or one. Deep Pluralism or Two Great Truths or all that kind of stuff. Yeah. 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 Well, but I, I, I collect definitions 
the people and people give definitions. And so I uh, pulled up my definitions list of, and I remember Griffin had one where he said that religion was a complex set of beliefs, stories, traditions, emotions, attitudes, dispositions, institutions, artistic creations, and practices, both cultic and ethical, both communal and individual, oriented around the desire to be in harmony with an ultimate reality that is understood to be holy and thereby to provide life with meaning. That was his uh, his definition of religion, and I oh. and I always thought um, that you you know usually when we define religion, we have so much of our own tradition sneak in in the back door mm-hmm. that um, like our definition of religion either needs to be set aside because there are those that are like, well, religion's a bad category. Look what it did. Um, if someone's going to say that on the podcast in a few weeks, or you have to go back to the definition and go, yeah, when the you know, 19th century and 18th century intellectuals in the West came up with religion, it happened to sound like monotheism, probably flavored with Jesus as obviously the best part, because <laughs> why not? Especially if you're German, it makes sense. Um, and, and redefine it to, to broaden it out. Uh, but that expanding and common denominator move isn't isn't really the final move right for being a pluralist like that's where the pushback you have for someone like John Hick or whatever is right mm. yeah or maybe I say think- something tell us about John Hick and then what what a deep pluralism is kind of resisting in it so yeah so for like a the deep pluralism that that Griffin identifies within Cobb uh, more of like a process approach but not limited to that uh, he contrasts with a type of pluralism that says, um, sure, you have you have plurality, um, but underneath all of that is an, an ultimate unity. Um, so that the differences are really sort of shallow differences. Uh, the embrace of plurality is really only at the shallow level because at this underlying, more fundamental, deeper level, there's unity around something, you know, um, the real or, you know, some sort of single ultimate. Mm-hmm. Um, but that a, a deeper pluralism can allow for uh, more, well, basically to allow uh, difference to sort of win the day. Um, some people sort of de- described it as a difference between, instead of having many paths of one mountain, maybe there are many mountains, mm-hmm. um, many, many ultimates, many end goals, many um, things that the religions are trying to pursue. Within process, in John Cobb's view, uh, there's a description of a complex ultimate. You know, you got things like God, creativity, the world. Uh, others have tried, you know, Darren Yamarino, I think, lists five in his uh, book. Uh-huh. Shout out to Darren. Um, but ultimately, for me, I think, and, and you mentioned, you know, moving away from the, the nerdiest description possible of, oh, yeah, it's a... Uh, Let's 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 talk sexy about alternative logics and the you know impact they could have on your understanding of religious difference. Um, not a big conversation starter, but uh, intellectual humility, I think, is is really key for be living in a more peaceful world. And it doesn't mean that we have to hold loosely to our convictions, um, but I think that we have to be slow to um, be aggressive toward others. Mm-hmm. And and when. Um, when, when you're thinking of this idea of, uh, multiple ultimates, uh, I like, how is that not polytheism? Like, right. I think that might be the, the moment yeah. you start making multiple, what's supposed to be one. Yeah. yeah. Math, math, math. Well, yeah. Uh, I unless say, you're going to tell me there's three. Cause I then the I know question about the Trinity. Oh, right? well we got that math worked out. Okay. Tell me about that math. Well, three is actually one. The one uh-huh. includes a three, and it all is yeah. good. No, I think... Uh, Have you read the creed? Do they let you read the creed? They, you you maybe had too many CST classes. You need to talk to Dr. Min. Um, yeah. This is all... It's all there. Um, no, sorry. I'm not going to harass you. But... <laughs> No, but I I do think it's I I do think uh, what what is meant by having multiple ultimates. Um, uh, say a bit about that, like why? Yeah, so for some, I think you could actually say there are 
like poly polytheistically, there are you know the affirmation of more than one ultimate, more than one uh, divine. Um, I don't think Cobb goes that way. Um, instead, it's uh, it's a complex ultimate of interdependent, interconnected uh, existence, um, which I think is why you know Whitehead would say you know it's as true to say that God is in the world as the world is in God. Um, so it's it's about the the interplay and the interconnection, um, but but enough that allows distinction. So so Cobb talks about you know, cosmic, acosmic, and theistic uh, descriptions of, of ultimacy. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, for those who want to say, oh, you know, and maybe more of like a um, an indigenous tr focus of the world is is what we're talking about when we're talking about the ultimate, um, John would say, sure, that's good. Um, and then for the, you know, the Christian or the Muslim, you know, who wants to say, oh, no, well, we're talking about god in the theistic sense he's like okay good yeah sure um for somebody who wants to talk about the Tao or some sort of more like cosmic feature as being ultimate john's like oh yeah sure um and then he says uh i think that it's not as if there are three completely independent separate ultimates uh, because then by the end i think your your question about math would be important uh how could something be both ultimate and not ultimate um, or can how can have more than one thing be ultimate? Um, but you know he would emphasize the the interconnectedness of of both the God, the world, and creativity, or the cosmic, a cosmic, theistic. Um, mm -hmm. Probably does not help much, but well, well, I mean, I think part of it is uh, those three are descriptors of where one um, uh, where one's piety attends, right? So if you it, if the holiness of ultimate reality is encountered in the world, then your piety takes a very different, uh, a different shape. And and I, I mean in the world as in something like uh, uh, a a type of more uh, different shapes of tribal religions or sure. uh, that kind of thing. Not like the like, ultimate is the world in your Spinoza or something. I don't know. Yeah. like. Um, and if it's towards God, then um, it. And the word ultimate applies to it. It tends to be some form of monotheism or um, Trinitarian, or you know. <laughs> and 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 if it's if it's to you know, suchness or like that that which everything participates in and nothing is fully in and of itself, or the principle of identity or that kind of thing, then right. you then you have a very different shape of pie, and that ends up with a much more um, Eastern religions tend to. Uh, direct their holiness and the piety uh, in in forms of communities and practice that tend that way. And uh, for me, one of the things that I found in us is one, it rejects that kind of notion around perennial philosophy where mm -hmm. you want to go like every religion's really doing the same thing. Like, look, the gold right. rules everywhere. Congratulations. Let's um, just hold hands and sing Kumbaya because we're all the same. Yeah. Yeah. The, yeah. And, and, I think that actually is does a disservice to the distinctiveness of each tradition and the experiences of people from different traditions. Mm -hmm. Just sort of just wash it away and say, you know, oh well, it's all just the same. Um, that yeah, that's my take. Yeah, and 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 I think the other the other thing that um, that's helpful, at least for me, is once you you get rid of uh, omnipotence, which everyone should. Um, once you have that, or perhaps redefine what you mean by, it. yeah, if, you, if, okay, if you're an evangelical, redefine it to mean something different, like what the Bible means, not what Hellenistic philosophy meant. But, um, but you, if you get rid of this idea where God's power is primarily intervening to get God's complete will done, accomplished, mm -hmm. communicated, then um, the idea that God could have given an infallible and complete revelation of the divine nature and a plan for salvation for the human race that's as applicable on a different continent as it is a different planet is just dumb. Like, it, once you don't have that, then, then, and you think there's a God in relationship to you, then you have to start to think, why would there not be genuine responsiveness that leads towards something beautiful in all the different historic religious traditions, again, this is just on basic Christianity. Like if God 
is always in relationship with you and loves you, then would there not be wisdom to be gained in any tradition that uh, is a cumulatively shaped tradition that continued to give life and sustain people over time? You should just assume that's the case. Like, it, but but I think like the that get rid of the perennial, they're all saying the same thing. That just creeps me out. Everyone's equally wrong. And like, <laughs> it just annoys me. And then the moment it's not an option for God to just drop in some truth. And the reason is that's not even what truth is like. Like you don't like no one, no one, at least, okay, maybe someone has, but I've never had the experience as a minister where someone's like, you know what? I want to, I want to join the church. I've had a conf- I've confessed my faith and stuff. It was real nice. Like, um, I was sitting there. I was just having a normal day and God showed up at the creed and was like, you should say this. I did. And now it all makes sense. Like, no, that's not how people are moved. It's usually like you have an experience of intense joy or this ecstatic religious experience or your intense pain. Like there, it's like when you come to faith and have these encounters with God, it's not, uh, it's not because there's like a, a, a perfect conclusive cognitive box of ideas that pop up. And so, you know, God's not how God works. It's yeah. like you get rid of it. Then you don't have to be a, a jerk to all the other religious traditions. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> yeah. Well, and there's, you know what? I don't think that we all have to agree in order to treat people, each other with respect. No, but if, if you are treating them with more respect than you think God wants to, it is, uh, it's a little hard. I mean, I think that's the other side of it. Like, I, I mean, I know where I just feel like all progressive want to be nice and like you, you like, but if your God's an asshole, don't be surprised that the best you can muster <laughs> is one step nicer. Like anyway, yeah. I don't, yeah. <laughs> But that's but God is love. Yeah, I don't want to vent at you. But so when, uh, so maybe you can say just a, a bit about what, um, uh, what is meant by the relationship of God and creativity for uh, process in process philosophy. How do you, how do you understand the relationship between God and creativity? Yeah, that's a that's a great question. Um. I think I would say that, and, and I could be wrong in, in the way that I would describe this, but that uh, creativity is that, I guess, piece that talks about uh, sort of the novelty within God or that that uh, is coming out with and through God um, in, in cooperation with, with the world so that new things are developing and emerging, um, that there's a future, um, that there's more than just repetition of the past. Uh, that there's life. I mean, I think that creativity is is uh, an essential element for for there to be life as we know it. Yeah, and and I know one of the contrasts uh, that Griffin tends to emphasize is the difference between God as a religious ultimate and creativity as a metaphysical one. Um, and, and yeah, the- and there are process people, maybe not uh, process theologians uh, proper, who would try to do away with. God within the metaphysical framework and say creativity is enough. Um, and I can be a process atheist or a process naturalist and do, do away with uh, this theistic side. Um, John Cobb is not that person. Well, no, no, he's not. And neither is Whitehead. So, yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, yeah. The, but one of the things that, that, um, that I think, is helpful around deep pluralism. And I'd be interested if, if you have ideas about it is that one of the problems communities of faith have, and maybe we could just talk about Christians is that our language that is within the Christian tradition uh, that, that we use for thinking about encountering uh, non-Christian religious or a religious others mm. is imports a very imperialistic miss- missiology where we feel like we're like not really believing the gospel or we're denying the truth of we're not confessing Jesus with our lips and we're denying him before men, you know, like th- this yeah. is what you think we're doing when we're expecting to be blessed and transformed by en- encountering other historic religious traditions or, or, or something that I think we need to cultivate, um, 
languages and images that come from scripture and the tradition or rework the ones we have so that it doesn't have kind of a Caesar sneaking in in the back door going, obviously following Jesus connects to expanding the Roman empire. Why would y'all <laughs> think anything different? You know? Yeah. You know, I think one, uh, perhaps subtle but substantial shift would be to move in, in coming from an evangelical background. Um, this was the, an issue. It's like moving from language that emphasizes having the right answers. Um, you know, here's a list of the things that you need to believe. You know, you got your Roman road um, and this is the truth. And that, you, you know, so now as a missionary, because actually I double majored with an emphasis in missions as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, uh, you know, so I'm going to take this truth and I'm going to go out to the world and uh, make sure that everybody believes it because I care about people and I want them to go to heaven and they need to have the right answers if they're going to pass the cosmic test. Um, I think when you take a move away from that emphasis um, and focus more on right relationships, um, how we treat each other, uh, how we're, you know, caring for our neighbors, uh, providing for the least of these, um, you know, loving the Lord, your God, with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, loving your neighbors yourself, that the right answers or the wrong answers or any answers become less relevant. And we end up being able to engage in a more compassionate, loving, respectful manner with people who, for whom we are, are different and disagree. Mm-hmm. And I would actually suggest that that's a more Christian approach, uh, to religious difference. Well, I mean, don't you remember in the Gospel of Matthew where Jesus was like, if you enter a town and they don't want to identify me as Lord, if they then you tell them you are just going to go to hell. That's <laughs> You tell them that. I thought that was in John, but yeah. I don't – look, <laughs> John, John, Jesus is not he, – he doesn't send the disciples out on missionary journeys during <laughs> his mission in John. He sends them in the long prayer in Holy Week. Come on, Andrew. Yeah. There's a long mission prayer in John. It's just a long, long prayer for chapters. Yeah. Uh, but Luke sends out the 12, then the 70, and Matthew is just the 12. I guess the yeah. 70, Matthew forgot about them. Probably included Gentiles. Matthew's not hip on uh, having too many. Uh, he's not too Gentile. <laughs> um, yeah. But uh, so... So I'm interested in, uh, in, in this, this might be more trip asking than it, but if you're listening to the podcast, you can just listen anyway. So when you got done with your dissertation yeah, and that first, well, the first day or two, I'm sh- sure sleeping was fun, but mm-hmm. I've had a couple days in a row where I, my body over the last three years of writing the homebrewed books, dissertation, and articles and stuff like that. Now, it just feels like it should read and write from about 10 p.m. until 1, and then I wake up at 5.30 even though there's no alarm set. It's just like you should go yeah. ahead and outline what you're writing today. And it's like a blend between muscle memory and carpal tunnel? Like- yeah, I mean, probably both. Um, so so I, when, when, what are you thinking or what was your process of deciding what to do what to do next cuz uh no one's going to assign it to you yeah point um so actually one of the steps is over the summer fixing up my dissertation um and preparing it for publication with uh a new series with Lexington um called explorations and in indic traditions ethical philosophical and theological so I'll be publishing my dissertation with them. And one of my committee members, Jeffrey Long, is a series editor. So mm-hmm. bad props to Jeff for that. Oh, um, yeah. And uh, in addition, it's, uh, it's actually a lot of my work is, um, is focusing more on ecological civilization, um, on the sort of applications of process relational um, perspectives uh, in just trying to making the world a better place. Mm-hmm. Um, so I've got, you know, a number of book projects I'm working on with, uh, you know, a variety of process peeps. Um, process peeps. Mm-hmm. But yeah, it's a good point that you get to that place where you're done with school. 
people aren't, unless you happen to work for somebody like Philip Clayton, you're not regularly getting assigned tasks, uh, you know, what you're going to do next. Um, so, yeah. So, yeah, it's, it, there's, there's a little bit of freedom there, mm-hmm. which is uh, kind of fun. I know, you know, most people say, now that I'm done with school, you know, I'm going to actually read all those books that I wanted to read, but never got a chance to. Um, I've read quite a few books in the last few days and, and I haven't read for no purpose. Like, mm. like I, I mean, like, so things I footnoted or I wanted to read and stuff, I've, I was going through them, but I, I read a lot just for the podcast. So, um, yeah. I my natural reading pace is pretty fast and, and so I'll read a lot of things for just so I can interview you. And so, but reading a book to interview you, I have like a 90 minutes that I will like take the book and I'll, I have a, I play a game called read the uh, table of contents yeah. and guess the arguments and then go based on the table of contents to where I would think the turning points are and see if it's true. And I, I look to see who's footnoted the most, then go to the table of contents. Then I go <laughs> into places in the book where I would go, if this is their argument, here's what it would be. And, uh, and then if I guess right, then I like start making up my questions. And, but if yeah, I don't I just had this, I've had a solid chunk of time where I've been binge reading Netflix. Oh, uh, and by reading, I really mean watching. Um, oh, yeah. Like the the actual mode of communication of the text is different. Like it doesn't matter because a text is a text. And it becomes a text as you receive it and interpret it. So, yeah, um, I don't think you want to minimize the textual encounter with Netflix on your iPad. It's actually part of an oral tradition. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, the spoken word um, yeah. known as Netflix. Yeah, and and the thing is, see now I think we're on something. The Church of the Netflix. Oh, you're just like, look. Yeah, I just streamed all of Lent. I just <laughs> binged Lent this morning. It was like Holy Saturday. I haven't been to church in a while. I just binged Lent. I got super depressed and junk, and then realized, hey, hey, I could just take some caffeine, stay up. Then boom, Easter. I'm ready. So between Church of Netflix and God is Google. Um, I think that um, my mom will put me back up on the refrigerator and pray for my salvation. Yeah, well, um, <laughs> look, you, you, if you, if she wouldn't even be in the church if you hadn't witnessed. And oh, there we go. It's like you, you're, you're Awana's, and <laughs> and then your Awana friend's mom. That's all part of the lure, the lure. And then what happens is she prehended this previous memory about the Nazarenes, and this time. Boom! It, did you did you do Awanas when you were a kid? No, no. You don't know that we did. We are Awana cubbies. We're happy all day long. Uh-uh. We know that Jesus loves us. That's why we sing this song. Oh yeah, oh, yeah. you don't know that. Okay, so you're missing no. out. We, I, I, my family were Baptists, so we had royal ambassadors. Uh huh. Yeah. That doesn't sound very um, imperialistic, though. Um. No, like you moved up the rank, you just started as a squire, you know, <laughs> and uh, I'm going to find the pledge because I won't get it correct. The pledge? Oh, yeah. Nice. We, royal. No, not, not British. Oh, internet. Like, apparently the British have real royal ambassadors. Exactly. That was the first thing I thought. <laughs> yeah, that was not what I uh, was looking for. But Royal Ambassadors is w- what we were in, and you could, like, go, like, squire in the night and stuff like that. Hmm. And let me see. Do you have your the pledge? Oh, they clearly updated it. Not the same? Yeah, now now it's, like, wait, it's even more evangelical than it was. See, but it, what does that mean? Does that mean that, that uh, the, the Southern the Baptists took o- were and- taken over by fundamentalists? See, that, I, I don't know, but I feel like that goes back to the the beginning of our conversation where people, you know, you're, you're the faith that you're holding on to uh, isn't static. There you go. I mean, why not go for the callback? Because someone needs to. And, and now, let's see. There's something about, like, service and love. and But it, in it, it had uh, 
we, the brotherhood of all Christians uniting in service and in love. Hmm. And, and I, and my theory was when they got rid of it, that when you have, when you have the word like brotherhood and uniting sisterhood, well, no, yeah. I thought it sounded too communist. Oh, like, okay. Cause like the brotherhood uniting, un, uniting with all Christians in service and in love. Like they're like, Oh, that's, that sounds like too comrade. Hmm. Um, and That's then, a possibility. Because they used to the the campus ministry group used to be called the Baptist Student Union, and then they had to change it to campus ministry. <laughs> and I and I'm sure there was a reason, maybe that we don't use union very often in general for anything. But yeah. I also think they were worried that you don't need well, college students. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't an official motto. I don't believe it was in our in our uh, the manual of the Church of the Nazarene. But our our unofficial motto was. Uh, don't uh, smoke, drink, chew, or go with girls who do. Oh, that's boring. <laughs> yeah. Ah. So um, you're welcome. You want to, This is a true story. I preached at my wife's ordination service. Uh huh. And my opening line was, "It's rare that someone would ask the first person they drank, smoke, and had sex with to preach their ordination service." <laughs> so you weren't Nazarene. No, we start, we just started dating at eighteen. We could have been Nazarene. Like uh we, we kept all the unholiness until we were married. You know, it's interesting, you know, the, the kinds of things that you don't really like you go to church your whole life, but you don't put a whole lot of thought into like what's said and done up on the front, you know, standing in front of the congregation. I think one of the first times that I like administered communion, you know, I reading my scripture, I'm doing a prayer, you know, this is the body. And then I sort of like, how do I get people to put this in their mouth? You know, everybody's holding their wafer. They've got their little cup of juice. And I think I looked at the congregation blankly, paused for what felt like minutes and just said, go ahead. (laughs) Like (laughs) awkwardly, everybody's like, okay, I guess we, uh, now's the time. I mean, you could have said worse things. I could have. Though that that's very clear that, that you you were uncomfortable. I had no idea what I was doing liturgically. Yeah. Chew on this. <laughs> yeah. Eat me. Yeah. Right. Put Jesus in your mouth. <laughs> so, uh, between that and uh having to rebaptize somebody because we didn't get her all the way under the water. Ooh. Uh, oh well it's between that or dropping her in the river. Well, so, uh, I guess uh, that if you the had theological mistakes were had, if you had if you'd gotten your deem in, you, you would have known how to do that. Exactly, that was my my downfall. This the demons sleep in. Don't get them all the way under. You never know <laughs> what kind of what kind of scariness is creeping in the back. <laughs> well, uh, yeah. Well, uh, I'm glad we talked, and um, half of it was about pluralism. The other yep. half was about other stuff, and that's why uh, that's that's why you aren't listening to NPR. Hmm. That's that's what I say. Yeah, process people be eclectic. Yeah, yeah. What's the Center for Process Study website? Uh, CTR number four process dot org, or you could Google Center for Process Studies. Yeah, I think that's probably a safer bet. Yeah, um, I'm gonna guess that. A relational worldview for the common good.